Hello, hello. Um, what we're going to look at today are fillet brake tests. Any type of destructive test is really a critical part of learning how to weld, especially for the home hobbyist. Okay, if you're welding at home and you're a hobby welder and, and you just you get a machine and you, you know, your uncle taught you how to weld and you're sticking stuff together. If you've never had your welds formally tested, you don't really know how strong those welds are. And I've seen people uh, that have really thought they knew what they were doing and come to find out their welds were no good at all. Um, typically, uh, my students, when they do certification testing for American Welding Society, they only do butt, butt welds, groove welds, okay? And not only are those, uh, they only do in groove welds, but when they weld that groove weld, whether that's a limited thickness plate or an unlimited thickness plate, they know exactly where the coupons are going to be cut and they know where the destructive tests are going to be. So students can actually physically avoid restarts or errors in, you know, those two strips. You know, they know precisely where they're going to be cut. And it, to me, it's just, it's not as good a test as, as uh, like a, something that's 100% x-rayed or UT'd or 100% tested. Um, but at least when they go out into the field, their welds have been tested, okay? However, their fillet welds haven't been. So here at the school, I still do fillet brake tests. I want to make sure that when you are uh, welding, uh, and, and let's face it, fillet welds make up, I'm going to pull a number out of the air, I haven't researched this, but I bet fillet welds make up 99% of all welds, okay? Um, butt welds are a, a tiny percentage. Now per pound that may be different, but I mean linear footage, I bet fillet welds make up the vast, vast, vast majority of welds. And sorry guys in the pipe world, I, I'd be willing to bet that pipe makes up less than 5% of all welding and, and structure and, and other welding it makes up the other 95%. When you're welding here in the shop, you're going to do a fillet weld brake test exactly the way they would do it at BIW. You're going to test your welds to make sure that your fillets are sound. Now that fillet weld is in a T-joint, okay? It's a 90 degree T-joint. And the root of that weld is the, the part that you need to make sure that you're penetrating into. Um, the reason being is when you're welding for someone, when you're welding something that has been engineered, they're going to come up with a weld size. And that weld size is basically a perfect little 45 degree triangle. And there's factors of safety built in, you know, 60% of the yield strength or 50% of the tensile strength and so on and so forth. But essentially what's gonna happen is that weld size, the strength requirements are gonna be based on that. And that weld size assumes that it's a perfect little triangle and that that weld is, is penetrated into the root, not deeply, but just basically fused the corner and that the weld, the shortest path of, of breakage is through the, the throat out to the center of the face. So if the weld happens to break there, then that is, you know, that's the, that's the path of least resistance, so, so to speak. Now your welds might have wormholes in them, they might have pinholes, it might be porosity. Um, most codes will allow for some amount of porosity inside of fillet welds. Um, you might even have visible porosity if the pore size is under a certain size and there's not so many pores per, you know, X number inches of weld. Um, in some cases that may be allowed. But if you're just welding at home, you basically need to know, is my machine running hot enough to penetrate into this material to produce a strong weld. If you're going to go to BIW or weld someplace else that does fillet brake tests, um, I, I live in Maine, the Maine DOT uh, bridge test also includes a fillet brake test with uh, uh, 7018 electrode, either 8th inch or 532, and they want a half inch, uh, excuse me, they want a 5 16 single pass fillet on half inch thick material and they got to pass a fillet brake test, okay? And, and from talking with uh, the Tom Giles, he runs the test center up in Bangor, he indicated that that, that may be the toughest test that they have, okay? Uh, that may be the hardest one that there is to pass. It's been my experience that it is easy, easier than you think to miss the root penetration on a fillet. 
Now, if you're putting down the weld size that's actually required and you did not get root penetration, your weld is under strength, okay? Now, it might still meet the strength requirements because there's a safety factor built in, but the safety factor is not there so you can disregard it, okay? Uh, the safety factor is there because there are forces that may be present on whatever it is that you're building that are unpredictable and, and stresses in the weld that are unpredictable. So we don't want to eat into that safety factor. So what we're going to do is I've already welded a bunch of samples off camera. I'm going to demonstrate how to do the brake test here in the school. I'll demonstrate that at least once um, on camera and then we'll take the broken samples and we'll look at the edges and we'll determine you know which ones passed and which ones didn't. And, and then also we'll discuss a little bit what you can do as a homeowner if you don't have a machine with a hydraulic jack and you know everything else to test your own welds. So let's go ahead and set up and we'll get started. All right, first of all, here at the school, what is required for a brake test, and this is a mill spec, we're doing this exactly like at the yard, is basically you have three eighths inch thick material uh, flat bar, it is quarter, uh, excuse me, three eighths by four inches wide. It's gonna be tacked up into a T-joint. There is a cleaning requirement. This has already been welded, but essentially the, the edge that you're gonna weld and the center of the, the face of the other part, you can see here has been ground up, have to be clean. Um, also, the, the, the actual edge of the plate needs to be clean. And ideally what you're trying to do is remove that scale and you're trying to leave a nice, crisp, sharp edge there. What we're looking to do is we're looking to see if the weld that you put down penetrates into the factory edge of the plate. Now on this jig, I'm going to move the camera so you can see the jig, more important than seeing me. Um, there are little pictures in here, you know, the weld must face up. So you've got to put the weld in so it's just like the picture. Uh, later on when we flip this over to finish it off, the weld has to be placed in so it looks like that picture. But for right now, again, this will slide in here. Now, typically speaking, um, the, the, the machine in the high school shop here gets left, you know, wherever the last person used it. So the ram is already up. We want to make sure that this uh, a locking screw at the bottom for the hydraulic ram, I'm going to pan down a little bit further, right here. We want to make sure that that locking screw is backed out no more than two turns. So there's a half, one, half, Two. Um, if you back it out more than that, this could come out and when you push the ram down you're going to get covered in hydraulic oil and ask at least four students, um, tell me, they'll tell you I'm not lying, okay? So we're going to back that out. This is then simply going to be go under here. There are simply pry points. The upper and lower part of this and these bars on the outside, additionally this, are used as prying points. So we're just going to push this ram down. I can then extend this through. It's actually underneath here. And, I, and again, I can, I can push that ram down. Now, it doesn't need to go 100% all the way down in order to uh, work, but it, it has to go down. I'm going to tighten that back up, and I'm going to return this to the holder. Oh, by the way, this has a, a, a tapered end. That tapered end is not intended to go through here. It rubs against the side of the jack. The fat end should go in here and it hits a mechanical stop that's on the back side, okay? So I'm gonna scoot back over here. It's a little awkward because of the camera. And I'm gonna place this in just like the picture. I'm gonna slide it in about halfway. At this point, I can push this up. Now this is gonna be a weird video. I can push this up. This is a 30, five ton ram. It's way bigger than what I needed, but it's what was available at the time. So I, I can crank this up with my hand. It goes slow because it's, it's a high uh, tonnage ram. It takes a lot of pumps to move it. Once it gets to the point where it starts to get tight, I, then I can switch over to the arm. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand on the opposite side. I'm going to back this up a little bit right here. I'm going to stand over here and I want to make sure that I'm kind of, you know, away from this when I'm pumping.
you're gonna feel it all of a sudden get easier, and that's when the weld is actually broken. Don't, don't expect that you're gonna hear a massive crack. Um, you might, certain film materials, you know, sometimes on a plate, but it basically it's gonna pump, it's gonna get easier. And, and at this point, I can, I can kind of pump this by hand again, okay? So now, I can, I can remove this. I don't have to keep pumping until this is completely 100% broke. So I'm gonna, again, back this out, how much? Two turns. So again, half a turn one, half a turn two. I can then put the bar under here. I can pry up from this point just to get the ram down a little bit. And now I can slide the plate out. So right now the plate is bent, uh, you know, what, 30, 40 degrees. I'm gonna place it in the upper bracket, just like the picture shows. Of course, the picture shows this before it's bent, but the weld will be facing you. And then I'm gonna finish this off with the big lever arm here, okay? I'm gonna come in a little bit closer, right there. So I'm simply gonna hook this over the top, and then I'm gonna push down. I'm gonna move the welding machine that's in my way. If it doesn't break, simply pry it up, and usually, there, right there it popped off, okay? Let's back this camera back up. The top part of the plate, okay, the, the, the T part of the T joint, the cross part of the T joint, I don't give a crap about, to be honest with you. Um, but I'm going to take a peek at this, and I just want to demonstrate that what we're looking at is a weld, okay, that was originally a quarter inch in size. That's what's required for this test. And there's two restarts required. So right in front of each of my fingers, you can just see where the two weld restarts were, okay? Now, in terms of practical practice, um, if I was at home and I or I was having trouble with restarts, especially with stick electrode, I would have a restart every inch or so down the length of this plate. But if I look inside here and in this this break edge, you can see that we have a, a nice gray kind of grain structure. It is uniform. There are no wormholes or pinholes. That's because the plate was clean when we started. Clean is important, and there is nothing to indicate where the restarts were. I don't have slag entrapment, I don't have laminations, I don't have anything in there at all, okay? So, that piece for my students can go right back in the bin. For the, for the video, I'm using brand new material to alleviate the confusion as to which weld we broke. But these plates here that have been used, they, they work, they're perfectly good. I've got a good face right here, in fact, someone's already ground it and I've got an edge right here. That edge has been clean right here. The, the actual edge edge has not, so I would have to grind that up. But I could put these two together and I could make a T-joint, okay? So we reuse these until they basically can't be used anymore. Now, the plate I'm looking at that I'm most concerned with is the bottom part of the T. Now I've already determined that I don't have anything stuck in my restarts, okay? Again, my restarts are, are right underneath both of my thumbs on, the, on the, where my gloves are. But what I'm looking for, and I'll get some static pictures that might be easier. Um, I'm looking at the edge. The original factory edge, the straight line of that plate is gone, okay? I have actually melted in to that edge a uh, considerable amount, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, which is a lot. Uh, you, you might think you're penetrating all the way to China on your welds, but you're not, okay? Um, I'm looking at that edge to make sure I've consumed that edge. This would be a perfect example of a, of a passing plate, okay? Now, per mil spec, the plate is 12 inches long. We only tack the very, very ends and we only weld the side we tack. We're not welding both sides. We can't break it if we weld both sides. If we tack the back side, then we are leaving a tack on there that the next person that reuses the plate is gonna have to grind off. So we're gonna tack the very, very ends. 
Um, we need, again, two restarts. We're looking ideally for a quarter inch well. Now, in your personal world of, of brake testing, which we'll talk in a minute, you want to test the weld sizes you're producing on the material thicknesses you're welding. So if you plan on putting in a 3 8 weld in one pass, you want to test that, okay? Um, yes, with a fillet weld, you can just make it bigger and gain strength. But again, it, that's at a tremendous cost. Um, electricity, gas, wire, time, distortion. Um, I, I think, I'll have to look this up, but I think the statistic is something like from a quarter inch weld to a 5 16 weld, that one extra 16th of an inch, there's an increase in fill material of 52 or 56 percent, something like that. It's a phenomenal amount of extra material, which is again is money and time and distortion. So you don't want that, okay? And furthermore, if you make your welds bigger but the root penetration is not there, then they're not really stronger, all right? So that's what we're looking for. So what I'm going to do off camera is I'm going to break the rest of these and then we'll come back and we'll talk about them. All right, so let's take a look at these uh, plates that I just broke. Now, I've got my original flux core plate, and I've got a second one here that was welded in the horizontal position. Um, the plate originally right here, again, two restarts, quarter inch weld in the horizontal position. If I take a look at my, my edge, what I can see is that the weld itself, of course you can see the cross section of the weld, um, they don't always break down the middle, sometimes they'll tear out of the plate, especially if the fill material is overmatched for the base material. Um, the ones I have here today tended to break down the middle, but that's not the way it always goes. In fact, at the shipyard we're almost always qualifying with overmatched fill material, so they'll qualify with uh, 118 or uh, you know, 10718, um, which cross qualifies for 7018. So you do get a, a tearing out. Um, you may have a uh, weld that uh, tends to break, feels like it breaks easy, and another weld that breaks harder. Um, the toughness of the material, the, the whether the weld has got a flat face to it or a convex face or a concave face. Um, uh, stainless steel, you know, 309 will tend to tear uh, hard. It's tough, you know, but it, really, it's the root that you're that you're looking at. Okay, so if I look carefully at this root, um, what I have here basically is this fused into that edge. It, it, there's no real deep uh, penetration, but it basically fused into the edge. There are areas where it appears to have missed it. All right, um, and on those areas where it, it, it missed, um, you'd have to add up those physical lengths. Now, on a structural weld like this, you have to have root fusion, and you can have a maximum of 10% of that edge um, not fused. Again, that gets into the safety factor part of it. So on a 12 inch plate, you could have 1.2 inches of non-fusion maximum. Um, the, the restarts look solid on this particular plate. You know, I don't have any issues there, um, but the actual edge is a little bit uh, questionable, okay? Now, the next plate that I welded, I welded actually with short arc, um, and I ran 21 volts and I think 500 inches per minute of wire feed with 023 diameter wire. Um, and I produced a weld that kind of surprised me. Um, now I don't normally look at the, uh, the, the, the T part of the plate, but I do want to demonstrate here, um, you'll either be looking at this on video or a photograph. If you look where the, the restarts were, I, I, I have, if I roll my fingers around, you can see where the two restarts were, one here and one here. 
The weld itself is pretty solid looking, but you can see that I, the restarts were cold. I mean, it is short arc. It takes a second for it to get up to temperature. And this is on 3 8 material, okay? So I do have bad spots in my restarts. I have some holes right there. Um, those are areas of non-fusion, and those areas of non-fusion over time with uh, vibration, anything that's being under any type of cyclical loading, um, could cause cracks to propagate down the road. Um, if I go ahead and look at the, the cut edge, again, I can see that same spot right there. There's a little bad spot in the restart. And again, I have another one right here I can see at my fingertip. The actual edge uh, is not bad. I, I'd have to get my camera out and get a close-up look, and, and I, I will. By the time you're watching this, this will be in the video. Um, but I'd have to really look at that edge to see if that fused all the way down. I, I, I attempted to run it hot enough that it should pass. And I was using a weave technique where I was going not just back and forth across, but into the corner and out, up and down. And I'll do another video on short arc at some point in time. But that may, in fact, be a passing plate. Um, again, we'll, we'll get a closer up look. The last one that I welded um, was actually welded over paint. So I actually took some blue spray paint in the booth and uh, I, I, I painted both edges. Now I burned off some of the paint so you have like a greenish hazy look on the lower part above my thumb. But this was just one quick light coat of uh, Rust-Oleum, you know, paint. And in that weld with that paint, um, there really are no major pinholes. If you compare the edge, there is like micro porosity inside that well, okay? Um, very, very, very small, fine uh, pinholes. The grain structure looks a little bit different. Now, typically on a painted surface, and at the shipyard, we weld over, you know, weldable primer. Um, it's not the first side that you weld that's going to be the problem. And if the coating's excessively thick, it's just going to weld like crap. The reality is, is I welded that. I didn't even know it was there, okay? Um, I could smell it, but you know, it didn't weld bad. If the coating is excessively heavy, then obviously you're going to have some major problems. Most code doesn't allow you to weld over paint. You, and you don't, don't weld over paint if you can avoid it, certainly. But if you're at a situation where you have to weld over something that's painted, um, for God's sakes, don't weld over powder coat. That's just, that's way too thick, okay? But if you have to weld over paint or rust, do a, a test, an impromptu test to see, you know, are you getting a bunch of pinholes? The pinholes will usually show up on side two of the joint. And the reason for that is simple. Uh, when I weld the first side, the, the, the paint is being burned into a hot gas. And that gas can just escape through the crack. You know, it's a T-joint. There's a crack there, right, you know, where they come together. And that hot gas can just escape out through the back side. When you weld the second side, there is no escape. So the gas tends to come out through the weld, and it will bubble and, and propagate up through the weld. So the second side will tend to have a lot of pinholes. So when they test weldable primer at the shipyard, what they do is they take a plate that's 18 inches long, they weld up one side of it, and uh, then they weld the back side of it. They're monitoring voltage, amperage, travel speed, you know, all the parameters. And then they take a carbon art gouger and they gouge out side one and they break side two, because that's where the holes are gonna be the worst. And there are allowances for, you know, a certain number of holes and pore sizes and what so forth. Um, obviously, if it's a tight boundary, airtight, oil tight, water tight, fume tight, there can't be any holes in it. They'd have to be repaired. But for basic structural applications, you know, there are allowances, okay? Um, and that's a visual inspection topic for another time. Um, now, last thing here, okay? Um, in terms of the welding, um, the, 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 the flux core plates were welded with 052 flux core, 24 volts, 260 inches a minute wire feed, and it turned out to be 250 amps, okay? Um, so they were welded pretty hot, so I expected that they would pass. Um, there is a considerable amount more penetration in the vertical position than there was in the horizontal, which again, I would expect. I did not drag the flux core. I'm not a drag flux core guy. I don't like to drag 
anything unless I have to because it just makes for an ugly looking weld and the amount of penetration you get is uh, insignificant. It'll pass with, a, with even a push angle um, if you're doing it right and uh, the bead profile is going to be fine and additionally um, I can see where I'm going a lot easier when the nozzle's not blocking my way. The other plate, again, as I said, was welded with short circuit transfer 023 wire. Um, I don't know what the amperage was. I didn't look at the machine, but 21 volts and 500 inches per minute. It was uh, hot enough that it passed the brake test on 3 8 plate. What do you do when you're at home? Okay. Well, I've got, these are runoff taps we use on the ends of groove welds. These are quarter inch plate, inch and a half by three. And I've got two of them here that I welded up. And I only welded about an inch. So if I'm at home, I don't, I don't have 3 8 plate. I don't have a hydraulic bending machine. And even if I had the 3 8 plate and I made the weld, um, the reality is, is that I could be all day outside with a sledgehammer trying to break that weld and not do it, okay? Um, so I can take and I can do a little test piece. And I've got these right here and I'm gonna turn the camera and I'm just gonna get a hammer and device and we're gonna bust these things and we're gonna take a look at them. This was welded with flux core, same process I used uh, here. Basically, it's a tack weld, but you know, if that's all I can test, then that's what I'm going to test when I'm at home. This one was welded with my uh, Millermatic, but it was down at 19 and a half volts and uh, 260, I guess, inches per minute wire speed. So basically, it mimicked my plug-in, you know, my wall outlet plug-in Lincoln um, 110 MIG welder wide open, okay? And, and I suspect that this is not going to have much penetration. It's not gonna pass. All right, I've got uh, my gloves, I've got a hammer. And again, I'm just, I've got this piece I tacked up. I wanna test it, I'm at home, I got some scrap, I'm gonna just break it. Um, I suspect I can probably just set this down on a table or a surface, the back side, and, and get it started. So that's what we thought. It's not. Uh, it didn't. It didn't break because the weld is weak. It broke because the weld is small. But again, if I if I look at my my weld here, I can see a clean break. And I can look at the edge and I can see that I, I clearly melted into the edge. I got good penetration. Now that doesn't tell me anything about my restarts, but it does tell me that the surface, which was covered in mill scale and maybe some light oil, did not yield porosity, pinholes. Um, and if nothing else, I mean, my God, I, let's, Test your machine on some scrap before you weld. You might have forgot to turn your gas on. I mean, you know, make sure it's running right. All right, let's do the same thing. Second one, here's your little 110 plug-in, you know, uh, MIG welder, you know, um, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna test this out. I would particularly test your machine if you're running self-shielding flux core. You get one of those machines that, you know, welds without gas. Um, that flux core wire will absorb moisture. You may find that even though it seems to weld and it looks like it's penetrating, your welds may be full of pinholes, okay? And that's gonna seriously affect the strength. So I'm gonna do the same thing right here. Now, I, I didn't need the vise in this case, but except to hit on, I don't wanna pound on my fab tape. And I don't wanna hit myself in the face either, okay? So, Again, I got my little machine right here. I got a small little uh, weld bead on. And, you know, much to my surprise, uh, wide open on this little quarter inch tab, it, it didn't really do all that badly. Um, it looks like it's, uh, it looks like it bit in. Now this wasn't actually welded with a 110 machine. This was welded with a Millermatic 252. So maybe the performance is a little bit better, but regardless, you want to check it. Um, there is fusion into the root, but it's, it's not deep into the root. Um, and again, I also tested this on a very small weld. That's a, a really small weld, about an eighth inch fillet weld, okay? So if you're gonna plan on putting down larger welds, multiple pass or whatever, um, the root pass is the key. Um, so 
kind of closing up, I'll, I'll finish this one off here. We won't be too long. The quarter inch, uh, excuse me, the corner of a fillet is going to be harder to penetrate into than a butt weld. Um, AWS tests, you have a 45 degree included angle, we're on a fillet weld, you have a 90 degree included angle, so you, it's half, but you, you have a quarter inch root opening and a, and a backing bar. So it's pretty easy to penetrate into that corner, plus you're, you're, you're welding into uh, a plate that's been beveled, so you're melting a knife edge, okay, you're melting almost nothing away. That fillet weld can be a challenge to, to, to dig into. Now, if the weld is tight, it's going to be harder to penetrate than if there's a gap. On the brake test plates here, the maximum allowable gap you're allowed to have is a 16th, and what we really want is zero. Um, if you're going to weld over paint or primer or anything like that, rust, you know, check it out. If you're running flux core wire that's been sitting around for a long time, again, run some beads. Um, if you have the capability to do so, weld both sides of a plate and grind out the first side. Maybe on the first side, you just run a little tiny bead in there, cold, just to seal it so there's no place for the gas to escape. And then the second side, you weld it you know, normal and then get a cutoff wheel and cut that weld out and then look to see if you've got pinholes. Um, it's a really important test, okay? And we do it with all processes, all fill materials. So it doesn't matter whether it's aluminum or steel, stainless steel, uh, TIG welding, you know, 118, 7018, 309, makes, makes absolutely no difference. Um, hopefully that helps someone. And, and, you know, maybe you'll discover that your little uh, machine at home has uh, got more power than you think. Maybe you'll discover it doesn't, okay? Um, so be safe and, uh, you know, test your welds, learn your limits, and practice, practice, practice.